I'd like to uh, welcome uh, everyone to the uh, Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, webinar series. Uh, today's presentation is entitled Cloud Attacks, Threats, and Defenses. My name is Steve Warzala, and I'm the uh, CSIAC Outreach Manager. Uh, just like to uh, make a couple notes today that uh, phones have been uh, muted except for the presenters, uh, but questions can be asked anytime during the presentation. Uh, just utilize the uh, uh, chat uh, function uh, on your uh, on the left side of your screen, and you can uh, submit questions. Uh, and time permitting, we'll uh, we'll uh, get to them at the end. So our presenter for today's webinar is Mr. Gary Hamilton. Uh, Gary works for Assured Information Security, AIS. He serves as a research scientist in the areas of cloud computing, virtualization technologies, cybersecurity, and anti-forensics. His research in cloud computing includes attacker deception and containment, fight through, remote detection of malicious hypervisors, and protected computations on remote, uncontrolled infrastructure. Gary holds a master's degree in computer science and a bachelor's degree in computer science and technical communications, both from Clarkson University. Uh, now I'll turn the presentation over to Mr. Hamilton. Uh, good afternoon, Gary. The, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve. And so our presentation today is Cloud Attacks, Threats, and Defenses. We'll cover a brief overview of cloud computing, and we'll address the architectures behind cloud computing, and we'll start. And we'll also take a look at attack vectors for cloud infrastructure. And finally, the last thing we'll conclude with is an overview of some recent developments in defenses. So for introduction to the cloud, we're going to cover uh, the cloud computing adoption, the NIST definition of cloud computing, the five fundamental cloud computing characteristics, three service models, and different cloud deployment models. So the public cloud services are expected to grow to approximately $210 billion by 2016. That's a significant increase considering uh, cloud computing was not particularly well established until around 2011-2012. Um, both small and large-scale organizations are increasingly shifting to cloud-based services, and um, uh, there are several advantages to this. It provides them with scalability to those services, and it also allows them to uh, reduce on-site IT staff and also to mitigate risk. So in the NIST definition of cloud computing, there's a few features of it that are worth pointing out. Um, first of all, you have on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources with rapid provisioning and minimal management effort. So five essential characteristics are resource pooling. So in resource pooling, multiple customers will share provider resources. With broad network access, you have resources that are accessible through standard network protocols, typically over the Internet, although it's not necessarily restricted to the Internet. You may have um, more uh, locale-based. You may have internal cloud deployments within an organization. Um, you also have rapid elasticity. That's the ability to adjust your resources to changes in demand, either increases or decreases. With measured service, it's the metric that the provider uses to base their billing on. So it's the amount of uses. Typically, it's bandwidth. It's also CPU time, the amount of storage that you, uh, that you use. And finally, you have on-demand self-service, and that's the ability for the user to provision those resources through provider-offered mechanisms. So there are three service models, three predominant service models in cloud computing. Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. So, uh, you'll see each of those listed along this graphic on the side. And in infrastructure as a service, the provider is offering the hardware and the architecture all the way up to and including the hypervisor, but the virtual machines beyond are left to the user to provision 
and install up to their, their own dependencies, their own applications and software. And in platform as a service, that provider is offering everything up through the operating system. So what you get as a subscriber is access to, a, to one or more virtual machines with an installed operating system and it is up to the user to install their own applications, manage those applications. And finally, in software as a service, you have users who are purchasing access to the applications that are hosted by a cloud provider. So popular examples of this are Office 365, some of the Salesforce applications, um, so these types of uh, uh, environments. So <clears throat> we've got the different types of uh, provisioning models. Now we've got cloud deployment. So cloud deployment references how an organization utilizes the cloud. So the most prominent one is public cloud. And this is Amazon EC2 and Rackspace and most of the publicly available services. So that's a third party provider who's offering those services to general public. Next you have a private cloud. So a private cloud is when an organization um, deploys a cloud environment for their own internal uses. And this enables that organization to maintain strict control over the data and applications uh, code and access to those applications. And with a community cloud, a community cloud is much much like a private cloud, but it's a, it's a collection of different organizations with shared interests who share a cloud resource. And finally, you have a hybrid cloud which is comprised of two or more other deployment uh, models. So um, certain portions of service may be held within a private cloud, others may be outsourced to public cloud and, or, or community cloud. So when we talk about attacking the cloud, um, we'll hit very briefly on why, why the cloud environments are an attractive target. We'll take a brief look at cloud infrastructure and we'll try to build an understanding as to the different types of access vectors to these to, to cloud infrastructure and we'll talk about specific techniques that can be used to exploit cloud environments. So cloud environments consolidate sensitive data from many organizations. So you have financial information from online retailers, you have in certain cases DOD information, you have high-value information, and it's also concentrated in one location. So this gives an attacker a substantially higher benefit if they can penetrate the defenses of a cloud infrastructure. Um, and, and this was recently noted by the European Network and Information Security Agency, who uh, cited risks to, due to the sheer concentration of users and data. So. In cloud environments, you also find that defenses are also heavily concentrated, but much of the focus tends to be on protections against cloud instances more so than underlying infrastructure, and they may fare less successfully against sophisticated attackers, such as a nation state attacker or adversaries with access to zero day attacks. So, and again, a lot of the FedRAMP controls that you see to govern cloud computing for uh, DOD and for for use by the federal government do a good job of outlining controls that help to secure cloud instances but are not as strict and not as effective at understanding the threat and helping to mitigate the threat to underlying infrastructure. And again, just to call that out, a cloud instance itself is only one attack surface. You have other areas that an adversary can use to get at the data within uh, cloud environments. So we, we have a rough categorization of three types of attack services that an adversary can look to exploit. So third-party infrastructure is infrastructure that resides completely outside of the cloud environment. It's the network infrastructure, the inter internet network infrastructure, it's local area network infrastructure, it's the clients that, atta that attach to a cloud environment who communicate with that environment either to administer that environment or simply to use the applications residing in a cloud instance. So next you have the external cloud infrastructure. So the external cloud infrastructure is infrastructure residing, with it, but residing at the cloud provider that provides that is externally accessible, typically from the internet or from a local area network. 
So good examples of this are schedulers or different firewalls um, that are in place, as well as the cloud instances themselves. And third and finally uh, is the internal cloud infrastructure itself. So underlying the cloud instances that you access, you have an entire array of, of hardware and hypervisors and administrative systems and internal networks um, all used to administer and maintain those instances and provide that service. So the most damaging compromises, uh, the most widespread, um, are going to tar and try and target that internal infrastructure. If an adversary can get access to the underlying uh, infrastructure used to administer that network, it effectively gives them the keys to the kingdom. They have access in many instances to, to large amounts of data coming off the providers, to, to the instances themselves, to the code executing in instances, and uh, to you know internal network traffic and um, a wide variety of other uh, types of information. So if we look at a very kind of high-level generic model of the cloud, we take and we, we categorize those based upon uh, rough surface attack areas, the third-party infrastructure, the external infrastructure, and the internal infrastructure. So again, third-party infrastructure consists of the clients. They're the, they're, the, um, they're the end systems that are connecting to cloud instances. They may be privileged or unprivileged. And what we say, what we mean when we say privileged means that they have administrative credentials to create instances, to administer instances that are created, or to otherwise manage those cloud instances. The scheduler itself will meter usage. You have, of course, the internet itself, and you have administrative. So that's, that's, that's the third-party infrastructure. And within the external infrastructure, you have your cloud scheduler and your firewall. So the scheduler, again, is meeting, metering the usage. And you have cloud instances, which are externally accessible, but also reside partly within the boundary of the internal network. And storage servers, which in some instances may, um, may be externally accessible, but typically maintain sensitive data uh, internally. Um, I see a question pop up, can you define instance in, instance in terms of cloud types? So when we talk about instance, what we're talking about is a virtual machine. So think of it as, a, as an instantiated server um, that you're accessing remotely. So finally, within the internal infrastructure, you have really the, the, the bottom two-thirds of this graphic where you have cloud instances, themselves, which are hosted on hardware. You have storage servers themselves, which cross that boundary. But beneath that, you have, let's talk a little bit about the hardware, the hypervisor, the administrative domain, and the cloud instances. So the cloud instances are virtual machines in, in most cases. And the hypervisor is responsible for implementing um, sharing resources. So it's, soft, it's a layer of software run on hardware that allows you to emulate multiple machines and systems on that single set of physical hardware. So those cloud instances are emulated systems within, that, within, that, within a single set of physical hardware. The administrative domain is nothing more than a privileged uh, instance, a, a virtual machine. It has tools within that environment for administering, creating cloud instances, for suspending, for migrating cloud instances to other physical systems and uh, for uh, gaining access to those instances, and for also converting all of the input and output from cloud instances to actual physical device outputs. So you also have the internal network residing within the internal infrastructure. So that, in, that internal network is simply used for cross communications between multiple physical systems used to administer the cloud environment. So the administrative systems um, or use that internal network to deploy uh, and to otherwise manage from the cloud provider side. So if we look at cloud and attack techniques, what we've done is we've roughly grouped them based upon um, the attack surface. So looking at 
third-party infrastructure attacks, you'll see you have resource usage attacks, client attacks, and communications attacks. And we'll go through each of these at, at some level, at a relatively high level of detail. Um, you also have the external infrastructure attacks, and you have internal infrastructure attacks categorized under that with subcategories. So those in red are specific examples of attacks, and these are just rough subcategories. So under the class of third-party infrastructure attacks, so roughly speaking, they are compromises of systems used to access cloud infrastructure. So they do not directly compromise the cloud infrastructure itself, but they may involve authorized use of cloud instances to gain access to data or to manipulate the env environment. So, they're, so most of these techniques are simple, regular, traditional attack techniques that you see, like distributed denial of service attacks, um, uh, resource usage attacks that exploit um, a vulnerability in an algorithm. So specific examples, so under resource usage attacks, so the effect that resource usage attacks have is to create a denial of service effect against it. So it's using a system with access at some level to a cloud instance to create a scenario where access and service to other users is severed. So a couple examples are just traffic flooding, which tends to not perform particularly well against cloud instances just because of this inherent scalability. But you have other weaknesses in applications that you can use to trigger an algorithmic edge case that causes an exponential or polynomial space uh, execution time requirement. So you have a flaw in an algorithm where it works very well in most cases, but if you give it a specific input, it requires an enormous amount of memory or an enormous amount of processing time in order to complete that request. And in doing so, that helps you to not, that would help an adversary to deny service to other users. So next you have remote administrator attacks. So users of uh, administrators of cloud uh, instances are accessing um, that cloud to deploy their applications and uh, to configure instances and to perform other administrative tasks. Well, attackers can access these instances through compromised uh, through the compromised systems used to administer those environments. So, um, very basic technique. Next, you have communication attacks. So, communication attacks are inter rely on intercepting communications to extract sensitive information or assume control of sessions. So, most cloud environments are relatively resilient to this since they typically use public key infrastructure and, and uh, uh, strong encryption to, to prevent these types of attacks. So, so, next, you have external cloud infrastructure attacks. So these are the attacks that target your externally closed, uh, your externally exposed cloud infrastructure. So that includes your cloud instances, any schedulers, IDS, IPS, firewalls, um, and any externally accessible databases if present. So when most people talk about attacks against uh, uh, cloud computing, they're focusing on these types of attacks. So um, the most common techniques rely on traditional exploits. So you're looking at, ideally, ideally in, the, in the eyes of an attacker, a zero-day exploit, um, traditional buffer, flow, buffer overflow attacks, um, IDS, IPS evasions. Um, but um, provider protections are heavily focused on protecting cloud instances. And because of this, these attacks are better mitigated oftentimes than if an organization deployed their own software in their own environment. So cloud providers do a reasonably good job at mitigating these attacks. So next you have cloud instance, so techniques within cloud instance attacks, you have software vulnerability exploitation. So these are your buffer overflows or abuse of validation errors. So that's when code fails to verify inputs. Um, synchronization flaws, so if you have an asyn asynchronous system and uh, software components, you have potential race conditions between 
um, in the code and that you can exploit authentication flaws, failure to validate identity and permissions of, auth uh, of operators. So um, these are traditional attacks that you see uh, exploited against regular standalone systems. Um, next you have authentication attacks. Methods used to gain access to instances through legitimate credentials, so password cracking type attacks or password guessing. Um, next, so an adversary with access to a cloud instance uh, can employ binary modification or at some point in a supply chain or within an organization can introduce modified binaries um, that have malicious functionality. Um, they can either phone home or grant access to an adversary with a backdoor. Um, next, you have dependency modification. So similar to binary modification, an adversary who can gain access to the dependencies, um, libraries, uh, runtime libraries used in applications run in the cloud environment, if they can gain access to those and modify them, they can introduce malicious functionality. And finally, um, configuration, uh, when configuration files are migrated, are stored locally and, and migrated out to a cloud instance, an adversary can potentially gain access uh, to those configuration files, modify them to um, alter the behavior of the software run in that cloud instance. So next you have uh, cloud scheduler attacks. So these rely on weaknesses in that scheduler's implementation. So um, the scheduler is heavily um, dependent on uh, distributing um, service to cloud instances, to managing and balancing uh, traffic to different cloud instances, and to actually helping uh, to, to determine which bet, which software, or which hardware platform, and which location is best to uh, create an instance. So uh, co-location attack is the primary technique that's been demonstrated, that's been successfully demonstrated against cloud uh, infrastructure. And this relies on the adversary mapping that cloud infrastructure, identifying where a target instance resides, what, what the physical server, physical hardware server that's, that cloud instance resides on, where that is, and instantiating new instances their own cloud instances on that provider infrastructure until they have one of their instances created that resides on the same physical system as that target instance. Once they've done that, they can begin employing side channel attack techniques such as timing information to recover security keys and other information from the target instance. And once they've recovered those security keys, they can then gain direct access to those cloud instances. So next we come to internal infrastructure attacks. So internal infrastructure attacks are typically much more difficult to execute since it's generally expected that the network used within the internal infrastructure is air gap. So it's that private administrative network. It's not expected to be externally accessible by the internet. However, in certain cases that may not hold true. Um, so adversaries um, that can penetrate that uh, cloud infrastructure can get a, a significant level of access to data and uh, code and uh, other information. So the types of access vectors that you'd be looking at are malicious insiders. Not only do you have to address malicious insiders within the organization using the cloud, but you have to deal with malicious insiders within that third party within a third party cloud provider. And um, there's no guarantee that the types of security checks you use are necessarily um, consistent with the types of security and type of background checks that would be performed by uh, a third party provider. And you also have the added risk that it's not necessarily in the provider's interest to reveal um, the presence of an insider. Um, you have supply chain attacks. So Supply chain attacks focus on introducing malware into either the hardware itself or into the software of systems that are being deployed to cloud uh, infrastructure, to, to cloud providers. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more detail on specific techniques. Um, 
mis misconfiguration of internal network can allow external uh, entities to access it over, uh, say, somebody puts a wireless access point on and connects it up to the internal administrative network, and suddenly an adversary has a vector to gain access over wireless. Um, and finally, you have virtualization breakout attacks, and these are an ex they're very difficult to execute and relatively few and far between, but there are techniques by which an adversary who gains access to a virtual machine, in this case a cloud instance, um, the two are synonymous, um, can uh, execute arbitrary code that gives them access to the underlying system outside of that virtual machine. So when we talk about virtualization breakout, that's, that's what we're discussing. So the first technique we're looking at in administ administrative domain attacks. So administrative domain the administrative domain is a privileged um, e virtual machine that's used to administer cloud instances on a single, typically on a single physical system. So the administrative domain, which is also called DOM0, has access to the memory, the disk, the network, and pretty much the, the entire set of resources in use by not only the physical system, but the virtual machines cloud, or cloud instances um, created on that physical system. So DOM0 attacks, like any attack on the internal infrastructure is extremely difficult to, attack, to, to detect from the perspective of the cloud user. So the cloud user has access to a cloud instance at best. These attacks are occurring architecturally beneath the cloud instance. And because of this, it's very difficult to determine whether or not you've been, whether information you've created is being tampered with or whether or not your environment's being manipulated. Now, the other advantage of attacks against the administrative domain is that you can make use of available utilities that are provided within DOM0. So you have native utilities like Mount, which you can use um, on the uh, virtual disk image. And you have hypervisor administration utilities, and you also have the ability to deploy certain forensic tools, in what, in, such as uh, you know, uh, Wireshark and um, end case and those types of uh, technologies. So one of the simplest methods of attacking uh, a cloud instance from the administrative domain is a memory mount. And it's a very simple method. You use built-in OS utilities to mount the instance's memory space. And from, from that memory image, you can run it up against basic utilities, anything from, you know, custom analysis to volatility to pull out information like running processes, data, um, any loaded binaries, dependencies that are used, images, strings, all the types of information being uh, from in memory from that cloud instance. Next, you have another low-tech te technique. VM suspension. <clears throat> so, um, VM suspension um, relies on a utility provided within DOM0 to um, cease execution of a virtual machine in, or cloud instance and to lay it in so that it can be, it preserves the state of that system and then at a later time you can resume execution of that. So, when those utilities are available in DOM0, um, suspension, that suspension process ends up copying the memory state to a temporary file and halting execution. Well, it's a very easy way to get access to the memory state of that system and to tamper with it um, from, a pervert, from, from a preserved state. So you can, so after conducting the suspension of the system, you can run your analysis tools against it, you can manipulate it, and then when you go to resume it, It'll copy all the memory space back in, and it'll load and run the system and resume execution. So, uh, snapshots enable adversaries to easily capture memory and potentially m manipulate it. But of course, because it because it interrupts service to that instance, it's much easier to detect by users. So. And we have a duplicate in here. We're just going to skip this. So next we have back-end driver modification. 
So this is a little bit more complex technique, but um, this technique relies on the, on virtual uh, on hypervisors that use um, generalized uh, front end drivers to generate I/O. So what that means is when you have a cloud instance, the cloud instance itself does not have access to real um, devices, physical devices like a disk or to a network. So what they do is they effectively present, so the hypervisor presents a generic device for each of those to that cloud instance and the disk and network all use that driver to write I.O. When that I.O. occurs, that I.O. is written to a shared page in memory and the hypervisor intercepts that front end I.O. and DOM0 takes, pulls from that shared memory page and then converts that I.O. to the I.O. for the real physical devices, so for the real network interface card or for the real hard drive. So the technique involves modifying that back-end driver that's used to convert the generic I.O. to real I.O. And when you do that, you the modifications to that allow you to get, so for a hard drive, allows you to get block IDs and um, data being written um, to, a, to a hard drive. Um, it also gives you raw network data. And what you can do with that data is you can then map that and then you can tell what files are being accessed or written to um, and modified. And you can, you can intercept all of that seamlessly. And because it's done, again, in DOM0, it's undetectable from the standpoint. It's practically undetectable from the standpoint of the cloud uh, instance. So next you have network intercept. Now network intercept is another low complexity attack, te attack technique. So just like with, with hard drive I.O. and with, with network I.O., the, the network that the cloud instance uses is a generic, um, it's a generic representation of the network. So what you can do is once you've accessed and you've pulled access to that I.O., you can Sit in the, you can sit in the middle of that traffic stream between that virtual instance and the real network, and you can monitor all the data passing between those two. Um, so the basic technique itself does not work as well when you have encryption involved. However, uh, monitoring of the virtual machine can expose, um, uh, can allow you to decrypt those messages. So next you have VM firmware rootkit. So most of your uh, most virtualization implementations rely on a simplified uh, firmware uh, BIOS to handle boot of the virtual machine. So in the case of VMware Workstation, it's a it's a variant of a Phoenix BIOS, which um, um, VMware Server itself is more commonly used in uh, um, cloud computing. But um, adversaries can gain access to this image, analyze the code, insert a hook, and then use this to transfer execution to a block of malicious code within slack space of that firmware image. So if we look at it, you have some set of firmware code that governs the initialization of the device. And analysis of that code, you conduct analysis of that code to identify First of all, it has to be code that executes. And believe it or not, within firmware images, there are large blocks of code that are, code that are legacy and are never executed. So you have to ensure that it's code that's actually executed. And you look for a jump statement. You hook that jump statement. You redirect it to your block of malicious code, which executes, and then sets up a hook within that environment. And it can be used to set up a, a rootkit, a, bi a biospace rootkit. And then after it's uh, after it completes execution, it returns control back to the firmware con back to the firmware code and allows it to continue executing. Now, the advantages of this technique are that um, while it's difficult, um, there are also there are advantages and disadvantages. It's not only difficult, but it is also it is also potentially detectable from the standpoint of the cloud instance. Um, so. 
our next technique are hypervisor-based attacks. So these techniques are more sophisticated than attacks that are deployed from administrative domain. And they use modifications to the hypervisor to do very subtle and fine-grained interception of virtual uh, of cloud instance activity and they can not only intercept that activity they can manipulate it on the fly and that makes hypervisor based attacks probably the single highest risk in attack technique and probably the one of the best targets for an adversary so <laughs> Again, hypervisor-based attacks, they'll make extensive use of virtual machine introspection techniques, and they provide ex extremely fine-grained control over instances, and they're also very difficult to, attack, to detect. There are certain ways that you can detect it through timing analyses, but they're not, um, they're not obvious. They're, they're relatively involved. So... We're going to highlight a few of the different methods of um, attacking um, cloud instances from the hypervisor. And the first of these is context switch monitoring. So these are this is fairly sophisticated attack. Um, what happens is um, so the processor, the, the virtual processor's control register 3, CR3 value, is mapped to the page directory base for that process. And when a context switch occurs on that processor, the value of CR3 has to be remapped to the page directory base uh, for, the new pr for the new process that's being swapped in. So each time a context switch occurs on a system, you're swapping in a new process, CR3 changes to that new page directory base. Changes to CR3 constitute a VM exit condition. A VM exit condition is an event that occurs within a cloud instance or any virtual machine that the, allows the hypervisor to intercept execution and perform some of its own tasks. And this can be used to figure out what processes are executing and um, what the process ID is and what the process name is. And it allows adversaries to monitor specific process execution and to also exclude other uh, processes from analysis, and that's extremely important when, when you're trying to do analysis of a cloud instance because you have so many processes executing that when you try to do these types of fine-grain on-the-fly modifications and analyses, uh, it becomes very overwhelming quickly and it'll bring the system basically to a halt. So. Building on that technique is another technique called system call hooking, and you can pair these techniques so that, again, you're only doing system call hooking for specific processes. And this is another very high complexity attack, uh, attack technique. And what the technique does is the hypervisor is modified to intercept execution each time a process executes a system call. So when the system, so it involves loading um, the register value with a bad address so that when a system call, when, when the syscall, when sysenter uh, is executed, it attempts to execute at a bad address and that causes a page fault which constitutes a VM exit condition. The hypervisor can intercept that and use reverse the stack, pull arguments off the stack and figure out the system call ID and map that back to figure out what system call is being executed and what the arguments to that are system call R, and it can also modify those arguments, reconstitute, rebuild the stack, and then resume execution with modified arguments that um, change the behavior of what that code was intended to do. So the easiest example of this would be uh, the ntcreate file call. So if an application is attempting to open up a file, um, when it executes ntcreate file, ntcreate file opens a file handle and you can trap that execution and you can change the arguments on that and seamlessly redirect that user to another file with them with, without with no ability for them to detect it so again it's extremely difficult to detect these attacks um, you can do it with certain types of timing analyses but 
the timing analyses are not obvious. So the next technique is address hooking. So address hooking is a technique that you can use if you know the location of certain data structures within memory that you want to monitor or manipulate. And um, what you can do is you use the hypervisor to intercept accesses to those addresses and then you can monitor changes to those, you can manipulate those changes, or you can mask those changes. So, for example, if you had if you had certain data within the within the cloud instance that you say you were protecting a more basic rootkit within a cloud instance, and the cloud user were trying was trying to analyze memory, um, you could intercept accesses to the memory space of that rootkit and then mask that and provide any kind of data you wanted that masked the presence of a rootkit. Um, the next technique is uh, single stepping. So um, this is a little bit more. This is a little bit simpler than address hooking and system call hooking. Um, this is a technique that you can use to monitor execution of a process on an instruction by instruction basis. And um, the, the basic technique involves. Um, uh, it, it enables you to handle dynamic analysis of software and analyzing some of the low-level code behavior and operations on data. This is very useful for an adversary that's attempting to perform reverse engineering of software, but it's also very slow um, and, and benefits heavily from optimizations. So next, we have physical system attacks. So physical system attacks are attacks that an adversary deploys against the hardware and, and the firmware of the physical systems that are used within a cloud provider. So these, this is the physical hardware used to host hypervisors and cloud instances in the administrative domains. And um, this is essentially the lowest architectural level an adversary uh, can hope to get to. Um, these are somewhat. These are very similar, actually, to, exi to existing risks in non-cloud architectures. You'll see that that there's a move towards um, migrating and purchasing hardware from trusted foundries. Um, those are foundries that are sourced within um, within a specific country, and they're um, generally expected to be free from uh, certain types of supply chain attacks. Um, the first method is simply malicious hardware, and that is actually introducing additional hardware to a board that integrates malicious functionality. And this is, again, it's supply chain, or it's a malicious insider that takes a, a modified board and introduces it to and, and replaces a device in the cloud ar architecture to introduce it. Um, these are extremely difficult to, attack, to detect, and one of the more prominent examples of this was an earlier attack that was executed uh, in Europe against uh, chip and pin systems. So these are the systems used to process credit and debit card uh, transactions, and these specific systems had additional hardware that collected card details, including pins, and relayed those to attackers over cellular networks. And those attackers then clone cards and use those cards. Um, so the only way, the, the most effective way they found to actually determine this, they detected it first based upon the effects of it by identifying a pattern of uh, cards that had been compromised and then were able to narrow it down to hardware. And then they had to conduct analysis of the hardware before they realized it was specific modifications to the hardware itself. And those modifications made those systems three ounces heavier. And so what they ended up doing was going through and weighing thousands of systems and using that as the means to determine whether or not those systems had malicious uh, hardware integrated into them. So next you have firmware-based rootkits. So these, um, so these are techniques that um, integrate malicious functionality into the firmware of uh, devices. Um, so, for example, uh, BIOS as well as um, ne uh, network cards, sound cards. Um, so, 
the firmware uh, firmware resides on a device, um, for example, on EEPROM, in EEPROM memory. And during boot, the system will load the firmware from that device into memory. And then this is called the process of shadowing it. So it's copied from the device into memory. And then it's set up so that execution jumps to that firmware image. And then control is turned over to the firmware. And it's executed to initialize that device. Well, the issue with this is that it turns execution over to firmware without verification in in most cases. Uh, trusted computing does mitigate some of these issues, um, but let's see the specific technique um, of okay. So the specific technique to introduce malware into firmware involves again analysis of that firmware image, identification of a jump instruction, modification of it to redirect execution to a block, additional block of code that's embedded in Slack space of the firmware image. And then once it's done setting up its hooks, um, once the malware is done setting up its hook, the last instruction should return execution to the legitimate firmware code to allow it to continue executing. So this enables adversaries to implant hooks to inject malware that persists even after uh, reformatting infected systems. So. Um, so more recently, um, trusted computing has, has come a long way in helping to mitigate this type of attack. And with TXT, um, there is a trusted platform module resident on the motherboard of the system. And when, during boot, when firmware is loaded, to, before firmware is loaded, it does a checksum of that firmware image and ensures that the checksum matches a known good checksum. That's good. For instances, when you have an adversary um, introducing a piece of malicious firmware, but it doesn't help when that firmware, when that malware is introduced into firmware during the supply chain, since the trusted checksum would include the checksum for the malware itself. So, next we have a few points on defenses for the cloud. So. So there have been a number of standards that have come up. You've seen uh, FedRAMP and some of the FedRAMP Plus standards. Um, so FedRAMP is a government program that helps to standardize uh, configurations and security um, for uh, cloud providers. And federal, um, federal government can do business with any uh, cloud provider that has received FedRAMP uh, accreditation. Um, so this is a very expensive process. It's typically 25 to $35 million to become compliant and maintain compliance. And uh, they also have to do periodic reaccreditation. Um, it's, it's very difficult for uh, cloud providers that are not well established. And FedRAMP is very heavy on establishing controls, especially for cloud instances, on accessibility to them as well as setting up periodic um, reviews of security and dictating uh, the periodicity for uh, training of personnel and, and other factors. Um, in addition, you have FISMA, uh, which is uh, uh, requiring federal agencies to develop, document, and implement agency-wide programs for those systems, for agency-related systems. So you have NIST guidelines. Um, which are forthcoming, and some of the guidelines on security and privacy and public cloud computing. So this is in this special public uh, special publication, and uh, it helps to outline some of the security and privacy challenges, and uh, some of the considerations that an organization should look into before they outsource data to the clouds. Um, this is a relatively high-level document um, geared towards uh, management and IT uh, security professionals, and. Uh, We'll take a look at a few projects. So there's a couple projects running currently now at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, that are uh, looking at techniques for uh, securing uh, cloud environments. So the MRC program is a mission-oriented resilient cloud, and uh, they're working to uh, develop a system that can continue to function while under attack. Um, and um, the scope of attack is, is quite broad. Um, it's looking to develop a resilient and adaptive solution. Um, there's 
another major uh, thrust area is in homomorphic encryption. And with homomorphic encryption, it focuses on encrypting data. The basic premise is, is that you encrypt data locally, you send the encrypted data to the cloud, and then basic operations are performed on encrypted data. And uh, um, when that data is retrieved and decrypted, the result should reflect the original value prior to encryption and disbursement to the cloud, plus any of the operations performed on it. Um, it's extremely complex. Um, there are a number of hurdles that still need to be cleared with it. Um, it's computationally intensive, and uh, it's, it's several years out. So, and we've also included in the presentation a series of uh, references that uh, help to provide additional background and information on different types of cloud attacks and cloud environments, and um, as, as well as uh, defense techniques. So there are, I believe, yeah, 29 references, additional references, and that is all I've got. Oh, Steve? Trying to get back here. Okay. Uh, okay. <coughs> Sorry there. I was uh, trying to find the uh, uh, button to get uh, off, uh, to get unmuted. So, okay, we're, oh, we're no. back here. Uh, so we do have a number of uh, questions uh, that are uh, presenters uh, or our attendees uh, asked during your uh, presentation. Okay, and hang on, I've just clicked the wrong button here. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's see. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, so uh, one of the questions had to do with your uh, the definitions, uh, asking if they were uh, NIST NIST based uh, definitions of the the systems you were talking about. So the systems we're talking about are based on a genericized architecture. The issue you have with the issue you have is that the actual implementation at a provider can be can be fairly divergent from that. So what we try to do is create a, just a very basic model that gives you some of the high points of systems that you can expect to find. And the, difficult, the, the difficulty with that is that in some cases those systems may or may not be present depending on the complexity of that, that cloud implementation. Um, the easiest example is, is, that, is that it's not technically required that you have virtualization in a cloud environment. However, it's almost uni universally found in practicality simply because the technical hurdles of hosting and handling these on physical, uh, handling these with, and handling rapid provisioning and um, recovery and migration with physical system is, phys physical systems are so difficult. So it's a, it's a, just a very generic description based upon the research and development that we've done with uh, defenses and exploitation techniques in cloud environments. Okay, thank you for answering that question. Uh, so one of our other attendees, uh, they uh, they noted that uh, they've heard that the key security issues are tend to be mostly in the hypervisor and orchestration software. Uh, I, I believe you covered uh, several slides on the hypervisor, uh, so that uh, that definitely seems to be a, uh, a key area. Uh, how about the uh, orchestration software aspect? So exactly. So the orchestration software is is very much. So there's a couple different. Well, there's really three parts of orchestration software. You have the kind of front end pieces that that the user themselves are going to use to to deploy cloud instances, but Really what we're talking about are the utilities that reside within uh, the administrative domain in that cloud infrastructure, which are privileged and have access to those cloud instances. And beyond that, you also have any other administrative utilities that the cloud provider develops and deploys within their own internal networks to do that. And that's exactly the case that, that the biggest threat in, in by far is subversion of that internal 
uh, attack surface area. The the area that's not exposed is a, is is actually the softest area because it gives you the broadest level of access to data and computation that's occurring within cloud environments. So that covers that administrative domain, those utilities used to deploy cloud instances, as well as the hypervisor itself, the underlying physical systems, the internal network, and those administrative systems and utilities that are used to handle internal um, internal uh, balancing and administration. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next uh, next question has to do with uh, uh, the announcement of the machine. It's a uh, memor memorister based storage uh, memory, uh, terabytes, petabytes on the machine, laser and fiber optic communications between CPUs and memory storage and the redefinition of cloud uh, mitigation attacks, uh, or does that mitigate uh, cloud attacks somewhat? Are you uh, familiar enough with the machine to uh, uh, answer that question? Um, let me look into that a little bit more and get back to you. I'll see, I'll see if there's, there's specific implications. My first instinct is, is that there's not a significant impact um, but I'll look into it a little bit more and get back. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's probably a fairly new development, so uh, require a little bit yeah. more uh, digging into to uh, figure that one out. But uh, yeah. Okay. Our next uh, our next question: uh, If you're writing a trade doc like requirements document, uh, what key point do you recommend to include in in uh, such a document? Well. So, a lot of a good question. Um, so, a lot of the issues that you're dealing with when you're when you're addressing uh, trade-offs between uh, outsourcing um, information and uh, computation to cloud environments, you need to look at at existing risk mitigation plans and strategies within your own organization. And um, many organizations are, are externally, are, are entrusting data to cloud environments without necessarily, um, without necessarily a full understanding of what the threats are to that environment. And conducting that kind of risk analysis and understanding what the potential attack vectors are and what the impact are what the impact of an attack against your infrastructure and your data within the cloud is is, is essential to, to establishing metrics for your risk and determining whether or not um, migration of services to the cloud is, is reasonable. Okay, thanks for uh, thanks for uh, fielding that one. Uh, so next uh, question has to do with the uh, uh, various uh, standards uh, that you mentioned, and the uh, question is whether they apply to uh, DoD contractors. Um, you know, are, are DoD contractors required to utilize the uh, uh, utilize FedRAP certified providers uh, for for uh, for these activities? Uh, not currently. Um, so. So FedRAMP is for federal government only, and um, actually beyond FedRAMP, you have the FedRAMP Plus type um, 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 requirements, which are an additional layer beyond FedRAMP. So FedRAMP is treated as a base layer. Any for any federal organization outsourcing cloud services, uh, outsourcing services and data to the cloud have to meet FedRAMP. But beyond that, you have organiza organization specific ones. So DISA took up at some point um, head of DOD related um, uh, cloud standards. So it's FedRAMP plus DISA requirements. And those do not apply to private organizations. Um, what, you, what you can do is, is your best bet at ensuring some level of security is to try and draw from FedRAMP requirements and during negotiations with a cloud provider trying to um, ensure that at least a minimum set of requirements that, that you've defined are enforced. But it, there is no applicability currently to, to commercial sector and private sector. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, answering that. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. I think that's. Uh, I think we've gone through the uh, list of questions that uh, we received from our uh, uh, from our attendees. Uh, uh, so. Uh, I guess that uh, will conclude our uh, webinar for for today. I'd like to uh, uh, thank you, uh, Gary, for your uh, presentation. It was uh, very informative, very interesting, and uh, uh, we uh, we we appreciate uh, you sharing this information with us. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all for attending. Okay, everybody, have a good day. Bye bye.